Now we've got 30 year former federal prosecutor and host of Justice Matters on YouTube, my friend Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, thanks for coming back on. Great to be with you, Brian. So let's start off first with pardons. Uh, we've heard a lot about pardons lately. We know that Rudy Giuliani and Mark Meadows requested one, along with testimony that Matt Gates. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Biggs, Gosar, Brooks, all requested ones as well. Is there any indication to suggest whether they were granted those pardons that they requested? And how would you know? So this is going to be the big reveal. When people begin um, uh, to be on the receiving end of indictments, and let's hope they are sometime soon, what they'll do is they'll pull a pardon out of their back pocket and they'll claim that the government is prohibited from prosecuting them because they have a pardon. The way we should know, Brian, is there's an office of the pardon attorney at the Department of Justice, and there is a whole bunch of rules and procedures and protocol in place by which applications for a pardon are vetted through the office of the party pardon attorney. They're investigated. Recommendations are made to the president. And then once granted, they are recorded. So everybody knows precisely what the president is doing on the pardon front. However, all of that is waivable by the president. So, you know, if you listen to what people who used to work at the office of the pardon attorney say, they say virtually the president could doodle a pardon on a cocktail napkin or worse, he could deliver an oral pardon. And there is nothing to say in the law or the constitution that that would not be a validly delivered pardon. So, how would we know? We would know if they followed procedures, which we know they didn't. There are another couple of indicators, though, based on what we have learned, that suggest some people may have pardons. One of the things a pardon does is it extinguishes your right against self-incrimination, your Fifth Amendment right under the Constitution. So in theory, if you have a presidential pardon, you can't go in to a hearing, whether a congressional hearing or a criminal proceeding and invoke the fifth. Why? Because you don't have a fifth. Now, let's use that data point and look at what some of the people have done when they've been called to testify before the January 6th Select Committee. Jeffrey Clark, he pled the fifth. That suggests he has no pardon. Mike Flynn pled the fifth. No pardon. John Eastman pled the fifth. No pardon. Who didn't plead the fifth? Much to my surprise. Rudy Giuliani. We know Rudy Giuliani has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination because he's being investigated by the Department of Justice, most directly the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office, which more than a year ago now acquired a search warrant to seize Rudy Giuliani's electronic devices because a judge concluded there was probable cause that there was evidence of crime in Rudy's electronic devices. So for openers right there, Rudy Giuliani has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, but he did not invoke it based on what we know of his appearance before the January 6th committee. That's a data point, Brian, suggesting he has a pardon. It doesn't guarantee that he does because he could just be that reckless. After all, we, we know Rudy. But who are the other people who went in and testified rather than invoking their fifth? Um, Jared Kushner, Don Jr., Ivanka. And here is, to me, the most compelling data point. What did Kellyanne Conway reveal in her book? Now, if we credit what she says, they may be alternative facts, we don't know. But Kellyanne Conway in her book said, at the end of his term, Donald Trump, you know, ambled up to me and said, I'm going to use her word, hey, honey, you want a pardon? Everybody needs one. And she reports that she said, Mr. President, unless you know something I don't know, I don't think I need one. So no, thank you very much. She said she said she politely declined. But what does that tell us? If Donald Trump is ambling up to people who are, who are further removed from him and from his inner circle, like a Kellyanne Conway, do we really think he didn't give his own lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who did all that corrupt bidding for him? his own family members? Do we really think he exercised sound judgment and restraint and didn't give them pardons? Well, I guess that would beg the question then, with regard to Eastman and Clark and Flynn, why not give them pardons? Like, what does he have to lose by handing them out to, 
to to the rest of these guys, the people who were who were on his team, who were helping navigate or create this whole election theft scheme. Because as a prosecutor, I would argue that when one co-conspirator delivers a pardon to another co-conspirator, it is deeply incriminating evidence. And a judge, 10 times out of 10, would rule it was admissible to show that they were in the conspiracy together and he was trying to give his co-conspirator a pass. Because if his co-conspirator doesn't get a pass, gets prosecuted or pressured, threatened with prosecution, what is that co-conspirator going to do? Going to flip against Donald Trump. And remember, I, I am loath. I'm going to hesitate before I say this. I am loath to quote Bill Barr's authority for anything. <laughs> yeah. But even Bill Barr testified under oath that if a president delivered a pardon to somebody in exchange for that person's silence about the president's crimes, that would be a criminal offense. Even corrupt Attorney General Bill Barr recognizes that. So you're saying that Donald Trump left his co-conspirators out to dry, how unlike him, while trying to save his own ass. Um, I, I guess with regard to these specific people who sought the pardons, we know that seeking a pardon is evidence of consciousness of guilt. Does that play into a prosecutor's judgment in terms of handing down an indictment? It, it does. So the Supreme Court many years ago, in a case uh, in which the, the litigant was a guy named George Burdick, he was a newspaper man in New York, um, the Supreme Court said two things about pardons. It said that a pardon is some indication of guilt. The precise language is they say a pardon carries with it an imputation of guilt. The second thing they said is accepting a pardon is some admission of guilt. If I were a prosecutor and I knew and let, let's take a concrete example, Brian, we know Steve Bannon got a pardon from Donald Trump because he was indicted federally. He was being prosecuted for stealing from Donald Trump's base by creating this bogus We Build the Wall Foundation. How, how unseemly is it that Donald Trump pardoned Bannon for stealing from Trump's base? We don't know if, if Bannon well, got to keep the money. Donald Trump did it from his own base. So I guess what's, what's, fair, fair what's, what's, what's Steve Bannon doing it, you know? Fair enough, what was I thinking? Um, but now we know Bannon is being investigated for state crimes in connection with that, what was basically a financial fraud scheme. Because one thing I can promise you, when somebody like Steve Bannon commits federal financial crimes, including um, federal tax fraud, he absolutely commits state tax fraud as well. And fortunately, the New York authorities are potentially pursuing charges against Bannon in New York state court. If I were the prosecutor, I would say to the state court judge, you know, judge, the Supreme Court has said receiving a pardon, accepting a pardon is an admission of guilt. We want to introduce into evidence against Steve Bannon in his state case the fact that he accepted the federal pardon for virtually identical crimes. I think the judge would rule in favor of the prosecution. Yeah, that's actually, I, that's, a, that's a pretty brilliant point that I hadn't thought of at all. Just a quick question on that. Um, there wouldn't be any, any degree of like double jeopardy by virtue of charging Bannon with the same crime on the state level as he was charged on the federal level, would there? Double jeopardy only applies when you're dealing with one jurisdiction or one sovereign. So you can't try somebody twice for the same crime in federal court, and you can't charge them or try them twice for the same crime in state court, but double jeopardy does not cross jurisdictional lines. So sometimes you can be prosecuted in federal court and then prosecuted for identical conduct in state court. Now, in terms of this latest hearing uh, with Cassidy Hutchinson as the witness, she revealed that Trump knew that the protesters were armed and he still wanted security measures waived. And she testified that he wanted to join the protesters as they marched to the Capitol, basically him physically leading an insurrection. Does that prove criminal conspiracy? Um, well, it doesn't prove conspiracy because conspiracy would be an agreement, a criminal agreement between two or more people. What it does prove is it provides additional proof of Donald Trump's treason. And I use that word advisedly. But even before I get there, I think it provides further proof of a seditious conspiracy as it relates to the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, potentially, because they were armed, they were in the crowd, they've already been charged with seditious 
conspiracy. Fortunately, members of both organizations are cooperating with prosecutors. So I think before too long, we're going to hear about the links that are being built to guys like Bannon and Roger Stone, and perhaps directly to Meadows and right into the Oval Office. We have to wait to see how the evidence plays out in that regard. But I think it also ups the criminal ante with respect to the evidence of inciting an insurrection, inciting a riot, which is a different charge, and indeed inciting an armed insurrection. And there's another crime that I think is directly in play that we haven't heard much about after Cassidy Hutchinson talked about how he knew his supporters were armed with assault rifles, pistols, and other weapons. He said, take down the metal detectors, let them in, and then we will all march to the Capitol. As you say, that is him intending to lead an armed attack on the Capitol. So there's a crime called 18 United States Code 111, and it is assaulting a, a, a government official. And let's think about Mike Pence, because Mike Pence was in the performance of his official duties certifying Joe Biden's win. And 18 USC 111 says, if you assault or otherwise interfere, impede, or in obstruct the, uh, a, an official, a government official during the course of their duties or because of their official duties, you're guilty of assaulting a public official. And it's an eight year offense unless weapons are involved. If weapons are involved, it's a 20 year offense. Now, you can only stack up so many charges on Donald Trump. You can only confine him for but one lifetime. But boy, it, it, it is a smorgasbord of criminal charges against Donald Trump. Explain the process to me. L let's say on some planet in a faraway galaxy, Donald Trump gets charged by the DOJ. What happens next and what recourse does Trump have? What happens next, and I would bet a dollar, that's my betting limit, I'm not a high roller, that Donald Trump delivered himself a pardon because when was he ever going to forego a good grift, right? His advisors could have told him all day long, Mr. President, we think a self-pardon is a bad thing because you're actually admitting your own guilt by pardoning yourself. He did it. He has it in his back, back, back pocket. I am convinced. So the first thing he would do is he would pull out that pardon and then the Department of Justice would have to litigate whether a presidential self-pardon is constitutional. There's no legal authority. There's no precedent because a court has never taken that issue up. But there is an Office of Legal Counsel opinion that is a product of the Watergate days that says summarily, a presidential self-pardon is not permitted because no man can be a judge in his own case. That, and it's completely devoid of legal reasoning or authority. So I don't think it's, it's really worth the paper it's written on, but the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel, at least in the 70s, took that position. So I think a court would strike down a presidential self-pardon. Then the next thing is he would be hauled into court. He would be arraigned on the indictment. The judge would make what is probably not the difficult decision about whether to detain him pending trial or put him on release, home detention, electronic monitoring pending trial, which would be my bet, although I think he has earned uh, pretrial detention in my estimation. Um, and then motions would be set, litigated, and a trial date would be set. And here's one thing I am sure of, we can impanel a fair and impartial jury to try Donald Trump. I am convinced of that from spending 30 years picking juries in the courts of Washington, D.C. Can they appeal a, the, the verdict in a jury trial? Yes, you can always appeal a guilty verdict. Um, the defendant's appellate rights are are vast. The prosecution's appellate rights are very limited. Usually if the judge makes a pretrial ruling that is dispositive of the case, for example, if a judge ruled in pretrial litigation that I don't think you can try a former president and dismissed the indictment, that would be an appealable ruling by the prosecutors, but appealable rulings by prosecutors are very few and far between. What's the end of the line in terms of an appeal? Like how far does Trump, can Trump go in terms of, let's say, you know, all the stars align and he does, and, and the jury does uh, uh, find him guilty, how far can he go in terms in of- In theory, appealing? he can go all the way up to the Supreme Court. He would go from the Federal District Trial Court to the DC Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, and then up to the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court decided to exercise jurisdiction. 
There are thousands of cases appealed to the Supreme Court every year, and they only accept review of a very small fraction of those cases because most cases don't present an important constitutional issue to be resolved. Now, if we convicted a former president, I'm quite sure the Supreme Court would want to weigh in, right? Here's the good news. And, you know, I, I have not been pulling out the O word optimism all that much recently, but the court, in my opinion, held fast in the election challenge cases, right? They did not accept review in a single case that was attacking Joe Biden's win. Why? Well, one would like to think because there were no significant constitutional issues to be litigated. I think there's something else at play. If the Supreme Court accepted review of, the, of a case and did something that installed Donald Trump as a de facto dictator. You know what dictators have no need for? Supreme a Court. Supreme Court. Yeah. So I don't trust the good judgment, the honor, or the ethics of the Supreme Court as presently constituted, but I do trust that they are so power hungry and egomaniacal, and they so dearly covet their power that they will not do anything that runs the risk of installing Trump back into the presidency um, to, to make him a dictator. Yeah, well, maybe eight of them. Uh, can't, can't, say, can't say as much for all nine. Um, you know, more broadly in these hearings, we've learned that Trump knew the truth about election fraud. He knew the truth about the outcome, about the danger posed by these protesters, about the illegality of John Eastman's scheme for Mike Pence. Um, and yet he continued to lie and incite violence regardless. Is there any reason that you could find that the DOJ would not indict Trump? Is there, you know, are there any potential holes in the DOJ's case against him? No. This case, based on the public reporting alone, is stronger than the vast majority of cases I tried as a career prosecutor. If the DOJ declines to prosecute Donald Trump, it will be a political decision. It will not be a decision based on the facts and based on an application of the law to those facts. But given some of these recent revelations together with witness tampering, which is a big deal and should be handled in a way very different from the other substantive crimes that Donald Trump committed, um, I, I don't think the Department of Justice can decline to prosecute Donald Trump and retain any modicum of legitimacy as a law enforcement agency. And I think Merrick Garland is keenly interested in the legitimacy of the Department of Justice as an institution. And the only way to retain that legitimacy is by holding Trump accountable for his crimes. So Mike Flynn uh, pleaded the fifth when asked if he believes in a peaceful transition of power. What was your response to that moment? My response to that moment was, and I'm a former Army JAG prosecutor. I tried court martial cases back in the 80s into the early 90s. Mike Flynn should be restored to active duty and should be court martialed period. And there are cases, appellate court cases, that stand for the proposition that that is a lawful process, that the military can restore to active duty a retired officer and can prosecute him for his crimes, including crimes he committed while retired. This We are paying his, his retirement salary. And he is saying, I would incriminate myself if I answered the question, whether I believe in the peaceful transition of presidential power. That's an abomination. And that is just, it's an obscenity for a retired military flag officer to give that kind of an answer. Okay, so let's finish off with this. You know, more than ever before, people have been writing to me that they're scared about what's going on, that they feel powerless. Like I've, I've been doing these videos for years, even in the depths of the Trump administration, it never felt so dire. Obviously, the Supreme Court has a lot to do with that, too. But also the way that Trumpism has pervaded almost every race across the country as we head into midterms now. What do you say to people who see how dismal things have been going, you know, who are looking for some reassurance? So it's hard to reassure them substantively because DOJ has lingered far too long without charging any of the command structure of the insurrection. I still believe that's coming. Um, but what I tell people is engage, engage, engage. So one of the things I did was I printed out from the uh, Virginia government website, a stack of voter registration forms, check your local state rules, regulations, and statutes to make sure you're not running afoul of them. And I choose to act as my own little 
mobile voter registration unit. I don't care if it's the grocery store, the gas station or wherever. I'm like, are you registered to vote? Are you interested in registering to vote? Because I have a form here and I'm happy to help you fill it out if you need help. If everybody engaged, Brian, I, I think, and, and it's not, this is not just window dressing. I mean, if everybody engaged like that, you know, we could probably vote in numbers too big to rig and too real to steal, notwithstanding the state legislature's, you know, determination to nullify our votes. We can overcome that. And that kind of engagement, I think, makes you feel good, gives you purpose, and it's motivating. That's something you can do concretely to, to kind of hold at bay the, the despair and desperation. We are on the exact same page on this. People have asked me, you know, like, what can I do? I said, number one, the very first thing that you can do is just be responsible for your circle of people and just find a couple people who haven't voted. I mean, we all have somebody in our family and our group of friends who, you know, doesn't vote, who is more apolitical, who, who uh, sees themselves as like more in the middle of both sides. You know, like everybody has that person. But if you look at Wisconsin, for example, Biden won the election in Wisconsin by three votes per precinct. That's it. So like, if you don't think that you can have a huge impact by just finding one or two or three people in your circle who you can convince to vote or not in your circle, like you said, if you're just, you know, out and about, um, it can have a big impact. And so that's the number one thing I would say as well is just to like get people involved in this process. Um, so so you're, you're, you're exactly on the mark there. Glenn, uh, I'll leave it there because I know I could ask you questions all day long and, uh, and you probably want to go have meals and whatnot. So Thank you for all of your time. I appreciate it. And uh, real quick, let us know, let people watching and listening know where they can uh, find find more of you. Uh, yeah, they can find me on the social media platforms. I think that's what they call them. I'm still playing catch up on social media, but on YouTube, I have a, a YouTube channel called Justice Matters, but I think everything is run other, under Glenn Kirshner 2. So Glenn Kirshner 2 on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, or just put my name in, put Justice Matters in and it will pop up. It's always free to subscribe. And that's where I get to air out the legal issues of the day, seven days a week, put a little bit more meat on the bones than I get in the three minutes I'm on with MSNBC each day. So if you, you want to get a little, uh, a fuller explanation of the legal issues of the day, I invite you to come on over to YouTube to Justice Matters. And that's Glenn, G-L-E-N-N. -N. Glenn, thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian.